So our second talk for this session is being given by uh, Truett Weens, who is uh, a physics professor at Briarcrest University, and he's also the CSEA uh, chapter leader for our Saskatchewan uh, local chapter. Uh, so and his talk is called Pierre Simon Laplace, Deism and Natural Religion. Well, thank you all for being here, and good afternoon. So in this talk, I'm going to be maybe trying to give a little bit of a different uh, flavor than the Laplace we're used to, um, as I'm guessing probably most people are physics, physics related in this room. So I want to begin by giving kind of a, a common sketch of Laplace and round that out a little bit by some accounts we have from contemporaries of his as well as from letters. Um, there are some recently published manuscripts um, from his biographer, Roger Hahn, to which really I'm, I'm standing on his shoulders in a very large way in this talk. Um, but these are manuscripts where Laplace actually speaks to his own opinion on religious matters. The bulk of my talk will be taken up in the third point where I'm going to look at the popularizations. Just briefly, what are their origin? And also, um, I want to look at manuscript changes throughout the very long time of their development and uh, round out with some interpretations on what we've looked at. So the most common picture I think that we have of Laplace is as a fairly straightforward atheist. And um, the reasons for this are numerous. So for example, he um, trained for a career in the Roman Catholic priesthood and left that um, almost immediately after finishing to pursue the career that we know him for. And also throughout his works, he's quite, um, he, he has some spicy things to say, let's say about God and about religion. And um, maybe the, the one anecdote that captures this the most well that most of us I expect have heard of is this uh, conversation with Napoleon where they held a considerable argument about um, the, um, about astronomy and the construction of the heavens. And at one point, Napoleon asks, who is the author of all this? And I'm expecting now the most early account of this conversation isn't the one that's passed down most often. Uh, the account that we have from William Herschel, who was present, talks about how Laplace wished to show that a chain of natural causes could explain the construction and preservation of the solar system. Uh, whereas the, the version that comes down from De Morgan um, is the one that has Laplace speak of God, I have no need for that hypothesis. Right? So it seems like um, sort of the pithy but less nuanced um, version is often what history gives to us. Right? So a lot of things, um, for me at least, are evoked in this conversation with uh, Napoleon's patron and friend. Uh, but what I'm hoping to at least give a little bit of a glimpse of is that the thoughts that Laplace expressed in these unpublished manuscripts, if we take them as the hermeneutical key to his popularizations, we can track how his form of deism is articulated during this synthesis period of his career. And I, I should just note briefly that there's almost a double difficulty in talking about Laplace on religion. So we know that he survived um, the French Revolution, including the terror and um, the many different phases of government, as well as being in administration for many years. And I think it's fair to say um, one learns to be careful not to say what you think too often in those circumstances. So um, this is also compounded in that a lot of his personal letters were destroyed in uh, a fire about 100 years later on uh, family property. So there's sort of this double difficulty. And so maybe this is almost like sort of a, a second order tweaking um, to the picture that we have of him. So when we look at the letters that, um, that we have from him, uh, Here's the picture we have. So this is a letter that was never actually sent to Laplace, but it's someone who got ticked off at him at a dinner party where um, Laplace had burst out and said, if there is a God, he should strike you dead the very moment you denied his existence. A fairly similar sentiment uh, about 20 years later where he's writing to the education minister saying that everywhere superstition has placed its fulcrum in an imaginary heaven to agitate and enslave the earth. And so you're almost kind of brought up short where another letter to his son, he says, I pray to God, he will always watch over your days. Keep him always in mind. So 
a few little glimpses of Laplace's later years come from some letters. And in particular, there's this friendship with um, a little known astronomer, Jean Frederic Theodore Maurice, um, that really was quite a point of conversation on religious topics for Laplace. So you can almost speak that there's sort of a warming to Christianity in his later years, where he, he says Christianity is quite a beautiful thing. And when Adam Sedgwick visited him in his last year, he said, I've lived long, this is Laplace, I've lived long enough to know what I didn't at one time believe, that no society can be upheld in happiness and honor without the sentiments of religion. And um, from all accounts that look at Laplace's life, Maurice's account of his last moments are taken as the definitive, interpretations vary. But um, in this um, intimate setting, Poisson was there and he mentioned Bouvard's presence, whose calculations put your beautiful discoveries on Jupiter and Saturn in such good light. Discoveries whose fame will never die. And after a moment of silence, in his clear and healthy voice, Laplace said, we chase after Shimra. So this really quick sketch of um, what we could say his religious views, it gives rise to really quite a large range of interpretations. Um, uh, um, maybe I'll just show this contrast where um, Roger Hahn, his um, foremost English language biographer, really um, casts him as quite a settled atheist all the way to um, one of the founders of History of Science, George Sarton, calling him a conventional Catholic. So quite, quite a range within there. So these unpublished manuscripts that I want to briefly look at. These are undated, but we can isolate them quite well to being written between about 1800 and 1812. So when Laplace is in about his 50s. So, Interesting history behind them. Uh, about uh, 50 years after his death, they were transferred by his family to the Academy of Sciences, sealed in a box by the secretary for 50 years. And now we have access to them in Roger Hahn's biography. And there are four manuscripts here. These are quite short works. Um, and I've grouped the last two together and I'll um, speak about them together because they're quite, um, quite closely related. So first, in this, um, where he speaks about the books of the New Testament, he um, gives this rather long excerpt from a, book that's, from a book that's really popular with deist writers in the early 18th century. And um, after that, he goes on to talk about um, the difficulties one encounters when one tries to harmonize the four gospels. He goes on to speak of a primitive gospel of a Jew filled with enthusiasm, preaching a pure and gentle morality and the equality of all men, promising eternal rewards, especially to the poor, directing his disciples to preach his doctrine to all peoples without distinction, became the leader of a widespread sect the entire remainder of his life, seems to me either uncertain, invented, or filled with absurd tales. So uh, when one reads this, it's actually quite surprising how favorable he is toward Jesus when you compare it against someone like uh, Baron de Holbach, who's uh, just a very strident materialist during this time. And there's this really interesting statement where he says at one point, the early Christians attached little importance to such details, even to several fundamental particulars of our faith. What, what's he talking about there? Our faith. So... In the second manuscript on mysteries, um, <clears throat> he approaches this um, and he registers his objections to just the general notion of mysteries on the basis that we can accept a proposition only if we can have clear and distinct definitions of its terms. So when he writes about the Trinity, he says, if I'm told that God exists in three persons, I can neither believe in this nor reject it, since I'm no more able to attach a concept to the word person than the man blind from birth can to the word whiteness. And so um, he calls out by name both St. Augustine and Bishop Bossuet um, for how they use analogy to um, argue um, for the Trinity. And um, also he calls transubstantiation the most absurd of all 
um, doctrines, where he says it not only offends reason, experience, the testimony of all our senses, the eternal laws of nature, and the sublime ideas we ought to form of the supreme being, ideas that this mystery perverts in the strangest way. So he, he's very much sounding like kind of your run-of-the-mill 18th century deist. No fan of established Christianity, um, wrestling with um, what is a coherent um, idea of God. And to, to look at the last two manuscripts briefly on force and causality, um, it's helpful to just um, step back to Newton's um, commentary in the optics. So um, query 31, Newton says that all things arise from the wisdom and skill of a powerful ever-living agent who being in all places is more able by his will to move the bodies within his boundless sensorium and thereby to form and reform the parts of the universe than we are by our own will to move the parts of our bodies. Right? So here we have um, absolute time and absolute space as God's eternality and God's omnipresence. And um, Gary, as you spoke of, we have Newton's voluntarist theology there. Right? That there's a strong analogy between our soul's ability to move our body and God's ability to act in the world. And so Laplace is going on to engage and sort of push the limits of this analogy. So uh, in these, these memoirs, they're, they're closely linked and both of them draw on our conscious awareness of what takes place within us when we act and when we perceive causality. And he uses the example of a man driven by hunger, seeing food. So uh, Laplace describes this entirely mechanical sequence of events that occurs um, that goes from perception through the nerves in our eyes to vibrations in the sensorium, sensorium, not brain, and then eventuates in the movement of the hand. And so then he asks, how do these motions of the sensorium give rise to these perceptions? What is their influence over the motions that follows them? And then there's this really interesting moment where he, he goes through kind of the, the main theories at this point of mind and body. And so he says, okay, we have Descartes' dualism, means animals are automa automata, quickly dismisses that animals have sensations and reactions far too much like humans to take that seriously. And he goes on to consider Leibniz's pre-established harmony. Maybe just pause. How familiar is the pre-established harmony here? Would it be 30 seconds to? Yeah. Yeah? OK. So Leibniz gives this image of two clocks that are moving in perfect unison with each other. One is the mental, and one is the material. So when we extend our hand, or we put up our hand, we have the feeling within ourselves that we're causing that, but there's no actual causal connection whatsoever. It's purely synchronicity. God is the orchestra conductor that conducts everything to happen exactly the way it does. Okay? Is that reasonably okay? Okay. So it's really interesting to me that um, where Laplace actually ends, or where he sort of doesn't... <laughs> Um, critique is Leibniz's pre-established harmony, where it's this, um, it captures this totally inexplicable but very real synchronized motion of matter and mind. So it, I find that really fascinating that that's where he um, ends up. And so when he talks about um, these illusions of causality, um, he talks the famous, um, famous ones from his physics, such as um, high tides, and so on. But then he also uses this image talking about the painter's hand um, being as determined as um, the tides of the earth and so on. And so we see his determinism um, on display. The power the will claims for itself is but an illusion. The sensorium acts like a spring without displacing the common center of gravity of our body and surrounding bodies. And then he almost goes into a little bit of a history of religion in these two manuscripts too. So talking about um, the way we extend our notions of causality and power, he says this, these illusions of causality and power have thrown men into the strangest errors, accustomed to look on the will when guided by the mind or aroused by the passions as the real cause of phenomena that it commands. They've attributed all phenomena to similar causes which they've endowed with the qualities of human nature 
but whose power they have exalted in proportion to the size of the effects brought about. Such is the origin of all theogenies, whose bases are astronomical. Okay, there's the, probably quite a bit more I could say about these manuscripts, but th this gives a flavor, right? So, when you read these, they're really reminiscent of a materialist like Holbach or um, Metri, um, but he uses much of the same language of springs, mechanical devices, but he definitely pulls back from uh, a, a hard materialism and from a strong determinism. Interesting. And so to have some definitions um, of deism, um, Tyson just calls it a rationalistic theology that tries to remove logical paradoxes and historical contingencies from our knowledge of God. And then another definition important for Laplace is accepting a natural religion with common ideas of morality and impersonal deity and the laws are plain and engraved in the hearts of all men. So as you spoke about natural law yesterday. And so, um, looking at his life, there are some interesting little deist influences that you can sort of sift out. For example, um, Laplace and his wife named their children Emile and Sophie. These are the title characters in Rousseau's famous book on education. And uh, we know that in, uh, at a, just before he got married, he bought the complete um, works of Voltaire. Okay. So that's a little picture of the manuscripts that we have. So now onto the popularizations. So um, after the terror occurred, um, the new government wanted a normalizing school that would teach the teachers of all France. And Laplace gave a set of lectures there that really formed the funnel for both of his works. And um, both the exposition and the essay went through five different publishings um, the essay had two that were published in the first year, the first two, and so we can kind of overlay this, and since he doesn't say much overtly, what I'm trying to do is to look at, okay, what does he add and what does he take out, and how can we track his thought that way? So really briefly, I'm, I'm going to have to really cut this short, but the, es the exposition on the system of the world, on astronomy, he he really paints this as a voyage out onto the seas. We're tossed about by uncertainty and the illusions of appearances. And finally, we find the laws of motion. Time will destroy the fictions of error and opinion. And it culminates with his nebular hypothesis. So from his book, from the fourth book, where he talks about astronomy of the ancients, listen for just how similar this is to his manuscripts. Astronomical knowledge seems to have been the basis of all theogenies. The fabulous stories of heroes and gods they presented to credulous ignorance was just an allegory of celestial phenomena and the operations of nature, an allegory that the power of imitation, one of the main mainsprings of the moral world, has perpetuated down to the present day in religious institutions. Okay. And then he goes on to say, to consolidate their empire, they took advantage of the natural desire to penetrate the future and created astrology. And speaks about um, the illusions of the senses, misleading mankind. I want maybe to just lodge in your mind right now, um, where he talks about the power of imitation being one of the main mainsprings of the moral world. So the same, it's the same word in French, um, just like we talk about the springs of emotion or the springs of, right? So clearly this is, um, both paragraphs here have really close textual links, both to the manuscripts, as well as to his encapsulating conclusion of the exposition, which really kind of gives his manifesto. So when God does come up in um, the exposition, um, typically you have a statement like this where he talks about a king who wasn't very happy with the accuracy of the data that he got from his astronomers and said, huh, if God had called me to his council, things would have been in better order. Qualifies it. With these words, which were accused of impiety, he implied we were still far from knowing the mechanism of the universe. So he also begins to make um, sort of sprinkle in statements talking about how he doesn't like different people's theology. So he'll start to, so beginning with the fourth edition, he'll start to 
give Newton a bit of pushback, saying how Newton doesn't quite follow the proper method, and he appeals to God's intervention um, to reform the solar system. And then in another edition, he gives the last word to Leibniz and how Leibniz thought this is too narrow an idea of God. And I think actually Laplace um, changed a little rewording of Laplace here for his purposes. So kind of sprinkled throughout here, we have real deist em emphases here. So there's um, constantly an emphasis on uniformity of cause and beneficence. He personifies the sun really in talking about its warmth and um, benign influence. There's a fascinating section of the exposition on how comets' motions are perturbed, where um, one commentator said, it basically sounds like he was ripping off Newton and Halley from their commentaries on the flood. He uses comets to explain um, all sorts of things. Um, even kind of puts humanity in a state of nature. So because we're so short on time, um, I would just flag up. When it comes to the essay on probability, there are a couple of sections that show really important increases um, in length. So this section on illusions and estimating probability grows from about 2,000 words to over 10,000 words. And so it starts off just talking about typical um, errors that might be involved in gambling. But over the course of his um, different editions, he begins to turn it into really a short essay on principles of psychology. So he talks to a great deal about um, how, so imitation and sympathy, the association of ideas and habits, and actually actions, habits on belief formation. And just explicitly says, this has great importance for the purpose of this work. And um, I have quite a few more quotations about that, that delve into this, but I thought I would maybe leave this. Um, he talks about his moral philosophy a little bit, but these are kind of um, different ways of interpreting Laplace that I thought are helpful. So quite used to thinking of him as wanting to evacuate theology entirely from natural philosophy. So final causes, um, kicking out religion, uh, where he actually has quite a bit more nuance in what he's wanting to say. Um, and maybe what's m one of the things that's really interesting to me is that um, Laplace's demon, that I expect most people have heard of, um, there's a distinct difference in how he articulates that. In the 1770s, it's a very materialist exposition. In his later years, where he's more of a, you could say, like an actual deist, it's actually uh, a more deistic interpretation. And that's quite interesting to me when it comes to Laplace. So that's all. I just finished listening to Life of Samuel Johnson, so I'm thinking about him in the context of the public versus private aspects, which Boswell talks about that a little bit. So, um, but there was this, this dinner party idea, and Laplace had this personality that he was sort of playing to. Do you get the sense that his personality, like you mentioned the dinner party personality that he had. Do you get a sense that there was sort of a divide, like people were expecting him to play a role, and as he aged, he was sort of mellowing or changing in some way privately? It, yeah, that would be really hard to answer. Yeah. Um, uh, the accounts that we have show um, maybe an incredibly arrogant person and um, that that tracked pretty closely with his success. Um, something I didn't mention also is um, 1813 was a really significant year. He lost a daughter and his son was almost killed on Napoleon's battlefield too. So um, yeah, I don't, <laughs> it, it's so difficult to get pers very much personal that yeah, it'd be really difficult to say. Yeah, no oh, thanks. Just an observation, he had a Catholic wife and they stayed married. So that may have helped moderate um, <laughs> some tendencies. As it does. <laughs> yes. Um, maybe I'll ask one or make a comment. So um, the, the idea of, La, of Laplace in terms of determinism and also yes. that um, harmony that you talked about, that there's no actual connection between our mind and 
the matter of our body, except that God is orchestrating both of them. So, so do you see that he felt that there was a sort of a separate um, determinism by God for both of those that didn't even give any real causation into human action? Yeah, the key. He goes right up to the limit of saying, <laughs> um, of denying that there's mutual causation, but he won't actually say it. Like, um, I don't know if anyone's read um, Huxley's Church and Maxwell's Demon, but Matt Stanley shows how consciousness is sort of within science's reach, but not its grasp. That's exactly how Laplace would be, where it, he doesn't. Um, in the manuscripts themselves, he, he's less determinist than we're used to thinking of him as. Like he, 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 will, he will talk about substances. He will actually talk about substances so that um, he, we wouldn't say he's a reductive materialist, that everything mental can be reduced. But yeah, he, he just sort of takes us up to the edge and then leaves us there. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Let's all thank uh, True once again.